so you can actually uh, gain access to it later on. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm just gonna start after the housekeeping. So welcome everyone and thanks for um, joining the call today. This is our fifth forum uh, at Sensilla virtually though, but it, it is our uh, fifth one in 2021. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Sensilab, uh, who are we, where are we, and what we do, because I can see there are people from all over the world joining the call today. So, um, so my name is Lucia, and I'm currently a PhD student. I'm doing my uh, practice-based PhD here in Sensilab. Uh, Sensilab was uh, founded in 2015 uh, by Professor John McCormack, who is also on the call, I think. Uh, um, and uh, it's a really uh, wonderful place. It's a laboratory that is uh, currently operating within a Monash University here in Melbourne, uh, uh, informational within the informational technology. And uh, we are a lab that um, works in the intersection of, uh, you know, it was founded by the idea that, every that everything is better when you can do it, uh, you know, when you actually can work with stuff and, uh, make something. And uh, to this day, from 2015, uh, Sensilla really became a home to some amazing projects and researchers. And just some of them are Air Sticks by Alan Islad, uh, Mirror Ritual uh, by Nina Rajcic, uh, Drawbots. Um, and you can learn more about Sensilla on our pages. I'll, I'll link something, I'll, I'll link our website uh, in the chat. Um, but yeah, and also lastly, um, we are preparing our open house here in Melbourne for uh, September 30th. So yeah, you can stay up to date with our news and actually drop by and see what we do. We have this amazing laboratory. You can just see a part of the meeting room right now behind me. Um, I'm not sure if it's 3D printed, but maybe it is. <laughs> okay, uh, enough about Sensilab. I am uh, very stoked to uh, welcome our guest speaker today, uh, calling all the way from Berlin. Good morning, Berlin. Uh, and that's uh, Thomas Spears. Um, so Thomas Spears uh, is an architectural designer, researcher, and a lecturer uh, who is working at the intersection of digital fabrication and uh, speculative historiography. And uh, he's currently uh, at a Bartlett School of Architecture and a research associate at the Institute of Architecture in Berlin. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Thomas. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking the time to showcase and tell us more about your work. Thank you, Lucia. Um, sorry, Lu Lucia. I'm, um, I'll mispronounce it. Um, hope that's fine. Um, yeah, th thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, you can all see my screen well. Just um, yeah, you can see this. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you to Lucia. Um, also, thank you to Sense Lab for this um, kind of event and for this series of events, and and obviously for having me. And also, thank you for all of those who've joined. Um, I see. It a uh, couple of familiar names and faces um, and also a lot of uh, unknowns and um, so it's very exciting um, to be here today um, and so today I'm going to talk uh, about my recent design research practice um, and the title of the talk today is called um, quite mysteriously at a moment but that will um, hopefully become clear throughout the talk um, uh, this time, your eyes, your 24 eyes look inwards. Um, parallax as a design research practice between speculative historiography um, and the experimental digital publication. Um, before I kind of dive into the projects, I want to introduce myself a bit to kind of situate um, the work. Um, so one important thing is that I've got this double disciplinary background. Um, so I did a bachelor's and master's in, in, in cultural history. And then I decided it was a good idea to do another bachelor's and master's uh, this time in architecture. Um, and this uh, 
like um, Lucia said, was um, at the uh, Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Um, so for those of you that don't know the school, it's quite, it's very experimental and, and disciplinary school. And that really allowed me to kind of start combining my interests. So on the one hand, kind of history and theory um, for my kind of first background and then kind of design and also technology um, um, as a kind of second part. Um, I then also worked in practice um, as a specialist for digital fabrication, worked on a lot of kind of weird and fun projects, um, and also taught um, and still am teaching um, at the uh, Bartlett School of Architecture, um, where in this teaching, myself and my teaching partners kind of pursue this experimental agenda with the students that always kind of moves along the edges of the architectural discipline. Really. Um, I also work on my own artistic um, and architectural research project, um, often moving between performance and fabrication. Like this um, project, and I hope you can see the videos because the, I mean, the connection will might not be very good across the world, uh, but I'm hoping you can see this. Um, so this is an ongoing research project uh, I'm working on, which is looking at uh, robotic incremental sheet forming of um, aluminium and steel, aluminium in this case, this image. And the, the project really is not just understood as um, technological inquiry, but also um, as a wider conceptual inquiry, we talk about this project often as a kind of conversation between the different material layers of the architectural structure that we're constructing, but also between that and the kind of various objects and physical and digital bodies that kind of inhabit the structure. Um, the reason um, why uh, Lucia um, in, in fact invited me really um, for this talk and why she approached me um, was uh, first of all because of my research um, kind of artistic and architectural into various forms of um, re scanning. Um, this is some work I did at um, ScanLab um, project. Um, but after that, um, after working there, I've also written um, quite a bit about how the potential of these kind of new vision technologies always oscillates somewhere between precision and error. And, and really, this question of how we as designers, might start designing for an eye that is not just human, but also kind of an emerging new kind of technolo technological eye. Um, that question I find really, really fascinating as, as a designer. And it's still very much a question that I'm um, asking myself now in my recent research, but not exclusively. Um, and so today I wanna um, to go back to the work I'm gonna talk to you about today. Um, I wanna talk you through um, three projects. Um, these three projects are all um, part of my PhD by design, um, which I'm, I don't want, which I've submitted and I'm going to be examined soon. So it's um, yeah, it, almost almost ready. Um, so these projects come from within that context, and I'm going to describe them using um, the notion of parallax. Um, and parallax really for me is a is a term that. Um, helps me um, give a framework um, to this research. And I, I use it to describe on the one hand, um, the kind of my historiographical or speculative historiographical inquiry. On the other hand, also, um, I use it as a term that helps me describe um, my approach to emerging technologies, artificial and fabrication. Um, but I think that will become clear throughout the talk. Um, and now I'm going to just dive straight into the first project. Um, and then I'll, I'll make some breaks um, in between to um, uh, twice actually between the, between the three projects for some theoretical reflection. Parallax one, measuring Adolf Loos's parallax, retroactive photogrammetry in the persistent off screen. You turn a page and enter the shop. You pass at the shop's threshold and register the scene unfolding before you. You capture the space from an angle. The mirrors lining the walls create a myriad of reflected perspectives and protagonists. The scenes many actors pause as well. Various men, some of them whole, some partial, some virtual, return your gaze, 
observing you from different directions. The woman at the center of the shop is less confrontational. She's turned away from you, as have her virtual images on the rear mirror wall and amongst the tires um, in the central between. Whilst her left arm reaches into the cupboard to fetch her undergarments, her right arm directs your view towards a mirrored image that looks strangely familiar. It looks familiar because it looks like you. Or more precisely, it looks like the person who is operating you. So the tailor shop we've just um, photographically entered is a menswear shop by um, architect Adolf Loos, um, designed and built in 1898. Um, and I want to use it to introduce the first understanding of the notion of parallax. So Loos himself was very much convinced that photography was mute. Um, and here's a quote. Um, so as you can see, photography says nothing. And he goes on, I'm against photographing interiors. The results are always different from the original. My interiors cannot be judged from photographs or reproductions. I am sure that in the phot uh, photographs, they will look awful, make no impression at all. End of quote. So now I'd like to ask, which part of nothing is it that photography actually can't capture? Perhaps it's the process of movement through his buildings, especially through the complexly interpenetrating spaces of his later work, uh, which you can see here on the screen, where it develops this intricate play of split levels, which can only really be grasped through physically navigating these spaces, allowing for this constant shifting of vantage points and perspectives. And it could be argued that this is actually a defining trait of architectural modernism. So architecture historian Peter Collins calls this modernism's parallax. Now parallax, a lot of you will be familiar with this term, but it's worth kind of just quickly defining it. It's the effect whereby the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. So you can think, for example, if we look at the simple um, camera, the difference, the parallax area between the viewfinder and the lens. So the fact that what you see through the viewfinder is not what you're going to get in, in the camera. I'm sorry, in the in the photograph. It also means so parallax also means that the objects that are further away um, when you're looking at them in movement. So for example, here in this case from, from a moving vehicle, um, objects that are further away would move um, more slowly through your um, through your vision than objects that are closer by. And Collins. Um, sees this aesthetic revolution, uh, he calls it, of uh, the 20th century modern architecture as a um, technologically enabled explosion of the use of parallax. It's technologically enabled because of the use of things like reinforced concrete and cantilevers, like here in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, or extensive glass facades, like here in the work of Walter Gropius, um, which basically means that there's ever more planes that can shift at different speeds and at different distances through my area of view. So if we now, now return to Los uh, after having had this kind of uh, intro. We've here again entered, just entered a space um, by, by Los. Uh, it's the Muller House uh, of 1928. And we've just come up this short flight of uh, short stairs. Um, and we've made a full turn, and this reveals another kind of winding staircase in front of us. And if we let our eyes wander, um, we see many vanishing points and sources of light. So, for example, at the top, there's this brightly lit stack of apertures, and that reaches all the way into the kind of dining hall and music room. Uh, below that, um, you can see another vanishing point, which is, if you look at it carefully, it's a bit more confusing because the light seems to be coming from a, the wrong direction and and it's actually bleeding down this stub wall um, in a quite optically counterintuitive way now what the photographer has done um, is basically he's applied the simple but quite effective trick the um, zone marked in red here um, is a mirror on a staircase wall. And that reflects the vestibule that we're actually standing in now. So that the, the, the lower vanishing point is a virtual vanishing point. 
So perhaps the photographs tells us very little about the actual spatial structure of the house, but it does immerse us into the experience of moving through its complex spatiality. I mean, I find this photograph absolutely amazing. Um, so we see this myriad of vantage points um, and vanishing points, lights and shadows and overlay reflections. And we're somehow immersed in this polyperspectival sense of movement through lots of space. So what the photographer has captured and what we as viewers experience is Adolf Loss's parallax. So we can ask, does photography really say nothing? So, okay, now we move back 30 years and, and uh, Loss is still a young architect. He's trying to kickstart his career. So like a lot of young designers still do, um, he's kind of fitting out bars and shops um, to get started. Um, and that means, Interestingly, there is a lot that is he's working um, doing interiors uh, within existing buildings. So if in his later work, his parallax um, takes the form of these kind of interpenetrating volumes, he needs to use more modest means. Um, and in this case, they're optical um, rather than spatial. Um, so he places this series of tall mirrors um, lining the side of the shop, and they reflect and doubly reflect the space, but also the shopper. Um, the shoppers and the merchandise. Um, a lot of people who went to shop here actually complained about the experience being incredibly confusing um, and overwhelming. Um, and for example, couldn't find the staircase up to the um, tailoring department. Um, and interestingly, if, if, then, if the mirror in this previous picture of the Muller House was a photographic device that captured an architectural parallax, here the mirror is actually used as an architectural device that creates parallax in the first place. So it's somehow a poor man's parallax, you could say. Um, so now the question becomes, which photographic device is able to capture the parallactic effects of the mirror as an architectural device? And I think this is where these carefully staged protagonists come in, quite literally. So these male figures that are entering the space at times seen directly, at times reflected or even doubly reflected. And their position is quite ambiguous. Um, historian Beatrice Colomina says that, um, quote, the dissolution of the figures into the wall surfaces questions not only their position, but also that of the person viewing the photograph, end of quote. So what to me these figures suggest is that ours is not just one of many vantage, is that, there's that ours is, sorry, <laughs> just one of many vantage points. And that each, view of these uh, vantage points is partial and relational and depends on the others to complement it. So as our eye wanders across the photograph and its multiplicity of virtual images and vantage points, we can't remain safely outside of the scene. Instead, we become entangled in its parallactic and polyperspectival composition and complicit in the event about to unfold. And actually, interestingly, this tension or a sense of kind of virtuality or potentiality in this picture is helped quite a lot by the fact that the shop was demolished quite, um, I think, a year after this photograph was taken. And actually, Lowe's destroyed all the drawings um, of it. So there's no uh, drawings left of it. Um, now, we can also look at this photograph differently. Um, and I think for this, we need to shift our perspective on parallax. So I've described parallax until now as this error, as a sense of multiplicity, as something that is difficult to grasp, as something that is ambiguous. Um, it is also a method of measurement, or it's used as a method of measurement. So since uh, antiquity, um, a stellar parallax has been used by astronomers to triangulate the distance between celestial bodies. And the same logic actually is applied in photogrammetry. Uh, so now we finally get to 3D scanning this guy. Uh, in photogrammetry, um, that actually uses different uh, photographs as kind of, um, um, uh, photographs, sorry, as input values. Um, now, if we look again at this parallactic composition of the Taylor shot, could we apply a similar shift? So could we actually see these many vantage points that are embedded in this photograph, real and virtual images? Could we see this as a photogrammetric complex? This would actually mean that we would regard the mirrored images as additional photographs 
and hence as additional photogrammetric inputs. And, and this is exactly what I did. Um, I'm not going to go in too much technical detail here, apart from saying that um, I used the two um, surviving photographs, um, as well as the um, mirror images. Uh, so these are the two only um, surviving photographs of the, uh, of the shop floor. Um, and then I wrote a photogrammetric um, resection script that would help me position and orient the uh, different cameras in this scene. Um, and here you can see kind of the um, photographs ending the jittering and kind of locking into place uh, in this iterative uh, script. What this allowed me then to do is to reconstruct a point cloud model of, of the shop. Um, and that in the next step then actually allows me to define the position of the protagonists as well. And we can see, for example, um, here in the, in the uh, plan on the left, um, that the most mysterious reflection, so the letter D in this image, um, is actually a self-portrait of the photographer. Uh, and this is what I was alluding to in the introductory text. Um, so he's reflected twice, um, and he stands just next to the camera that produces this very photograph. Um, so that, that, that's the person on the very right um, of, the, of the image on the right. Um, he's standing, in other words, next to us, or to you, as I said in the introduction. I think there's this nice analogy between the kind of self-referential gaze in um, just to tie it into some artist worker context, um, in Jeff Wall's reenactment of Manet in, in the picture for women, um, also in the in the kind of male-female relationship, actually. Um, so my photogrammetric reconstruction, in a way, confirms some of the intuitions that I already formulated about this photograph, about its entanglement of um, the viewer, in this case, of the photographer. Um, on the other hand, however, um, it also destroys our entanglement because we're no longer actually now that we've reconstructed it implied in the photograph when we're freed from this perspectival vantage point so we're we've kind of somehow disenchanted the shop and we're looking at it from the outside and somehow we've lost this perhaps this fixed space of potentiality and virtuality that saturated and that was so uh, saturated the, the shop's walls and it was so carefully constructed by Lowe's. Um, so in a way, we've applied what Donna Haraway would call the God trick, um, allowing us to look at things from an exterior perspective, a view from nowhere that replaces the multiple situated views and what Donna Haraway calls the privilege of partial perspective. So in the project, when I realized this, I, and I found out that I actually destroyed Lotus parallax uh, by misusing his parallax as a method of measurement, First, find it quite frustrating. Um, and then actually found out that it's not quite as black and white as that. Um, and I want to be quite brief about this part to be able to show some more projects. But um, basically, the fact that my photographic, oh, sorry, photogrammetric approach did destroy the photographic sh uh, shadows, it did destroy the photographic unstable and the photographic virtual. Um, but it also creates new photogrammetric shadows which actually lie within the photograph itself. And these are the points that are only captured in one of the multiple photographs. So they hence can't be triangulated using uh, kind of like the offset. So they form this sense of an in-screen, off-screen, and they can become then a new space of virtuality and speculation. Now to conclude this project, I want to, just reiterate this notion of, of parallax um, and how I've introduced these various kind of notions and understandings of the term. So in a way we can look at it as an optical phenomena um, and as a spatial temporal, ex uh, spatial temporal experience. Um, we can also look at it as a method of measurement um, and as a method of speculation. It can also be used to see a scene through other, um, be they historical or technological eyes, so in this case, we looked at the photograph through eyes for which the photograph was never intended. So the photogrammetric eye. Um, so there's a technological historical parallax going on. So in, in other words, this, it's kind of a multi-edged sword and it's a phenomena uh, parallax that we need to approach always from different angles. And actually I find the ambivalence of the term quite exciting. And 
So the fact that it's keeping us in constant movement um, and that the technological elimination, like we saw in this project, um, of one unknown actually creates new forms of unknown, like um, perhaps Virilio um, in his notion of the integral accident, um, where um, he says that a blind spot is created by each new technology. Um, so the yeah, integral accident. And, and I think this can actually help us ambiguate some of the um, narratives on um, a veracity on, on um, emerging technologies. At this point, I want to zoom out a bit um, before moving on, on to the next project and, and briefly interrupt with some theoretical talks. Um, parallax as synchronicity. Um, and to introduce it, um, I think perhaps a good point is um, returning to this original use of uh, parallax in its um, in astronomy. So, if, you, for example, we observe the moon from two different observatories, say Greenwich and Cape to Good Hope, um, we can use a parallax between these two observatories and, and trigonometry to calculate the distance from the Earth to the moon. Now. If we want to measure the distance to further away um, celestial bodies, so say stars, like you can see in this image, the triangle actually, if we would use the two observatories, the, the triangle becomes way too long and too narrow. So what we actually need to use is two opposite positions of the Earth's annual orbit around the sun. So for example, one measurement in June, one measurement in December. Now, what I find really exciting about this is that um, that this is not just a parallax between um, two points of view in space, but it's also an offset in time. So this metrological parallax also becomes a historical parallax, in this case of half a year. So we could argue that every type of historical research is always parallactic. Look at us having resources, but also being situated in our own temporary environment and research context, et cetera. We can also go further and say that this assumed synchronicity, which we saw in the stellar measurement, um, that we could take that more literally. And this is what I try to do in my practice, in which again and again, I deal with historical topics, uh, but using it um, in a very situated contemporary um, position using emerging technologies. And a term I use for this is performative synchronicity. Um, both of these terms that make up this compound, performance and synchronicity, actually build heavily on the works of Aaron Barrett. Um, and I can only give, um, and many of you will be familiar with the work, and I can only give a, an extremely simplified version of Barrett's account, uh, obviously, on, on, on physics and, um, and the philosophy she draws um, from it. Um, so to explain the first term, performativity, um, Barad uses the, the double slit experiment, um, very famous experiment that was actually designed to, first of all, to demonstrate if light should be understood as waves or particles in the 19th century. But as Barad explains, the point is that these properties, um, light being waves or particles, are not simultaneously observable um, or measurable because they require a particular choice of apparatus called providing the conditions necessary to give meaning to a particular set of variables at the exclusion of other variables, end of quote. So translated, that means that if you attach a detector to the setup to try and measure through which slit a particle is passed, you effectively destroy the interference pattern. So in other words, the nature of what we're observing, so lightning in the particles or waves, is defined actually by the apparatus that we use to determine its nature. And this actually means that there's no measurement independent state. So there's no such thing as pre-existing natures or pre-existing identities, but rather identity is, and this is important, it's performed in the action of measurement. So instead of this metaphysics of representation, um, Barad actually proposes mm, a performative metaphysics, in which being and knowing are not separable. So the photograph, um, the photographic camera 
doesn't just passively capture Lowe's Taylor shop, it performs it, co-creates it. Then the photogrammetric algorithm that I use to reconstruct it doesn't just reconstruct the three-dimensional scene, it also co-constitutes it. And in doing so, it creates its own technological blind spots. So that's performativity. Synchronicity then is based on quite a crazy modification of this um, experiment, uh, which is called the delayed choice um, quantum eraser, um, which means that we can actually measure through which slits a particle has gone after light is already registered on the screen. So in other words, after it's already exhibited properties of either being waves or particles. And it turns out that if we then, um, that this delayed measurement actually retroactively destroys the pattern on the screen. And if the measurement is then erased, the pattern reappears, which means quite mind-bogglingly that the very nature of light, so the identity of light is changed after the facts. So Barat actually asks us, does this mean that we can change the past? But she says that that would miss the point, or rather it would be a representationist misinterpretation. So time, like the past, like identity, is not a given. It's not something that is simply there and waiting to be represented. So time itself is performed, it's phenomenal. So the past was perhaps never really present to start with. Because all of this might seem quite abstract, but I do think that the notion of performance and the notion of synchronicity actually allow us to rethink some of the disciplines that are under question um, here. So historiography, technological capture, and design research. And in the case of my practice, it actually allows me to move away from the re, so representation, reenactment, reconstruction, reproduction, to allow notions such as co-enactment, co-production, co-performance, in which historical and technological others become synchronous co-creators. And I'm, I want to show this through um, a second. Parallax 2, 1910, a stroll through Abathea's rock garden. This time your eye looks inwards. There are 24 of them and they are flat. That is to say, they have no origin other than unity. The sharp edges of your planar eyes cut up the object into the thinnest of parallel slices. Each of your stacked 24 eyes sees a unique, well-focused slice of the object. Um, these were the first lines of an artist book um, that documents the second project I'm going to discuss today. Um, and this project extends my notion of speculative parallax. So using parallax as a generative rather than as a reconstructive diagram. And I do this by parallactically crossing things that don't actually belong together. And this starts with the title, so a stroll through Abathea's rock garden, which in itself is a crossing of the project's three main components. So first of all, the early 20th century practice of Jakob von Uxke, a biologist, um, and his attempt to understand animal others by speculatively seeing through their eyes. Then secondly, the practice of painter and naturalist uh, Abathea, and thirdly, the practice of collecting and fabricating Gongxi, or scholar's box. So Abbot Thayer um, was a turn of the century naturalist painter um, who discovered through his own practice, this tendency in animals to be darker on the upper side and lighter on the underside of the body. Um, he called this counter shading or denaturing. And he illustrated it through paintings like, like this one, uh, which he calls a scientific painting, um, but also through physical artifacts. Um, so Thayer claims that there are two ducks in this photograph. If you can find it, uh, let me know, um, send me an email. Um, because the one on the right is uh, counter shaded and hence invisible, whereas the one on the left is just left in its, um, well, it's not counter shaded. So you can see um, an image of the, the two ducks kind of uh, turned around so you can see this kind of counter shading pattern. Um, 
So in other words, actually, the duck on the right is compensating for toplit environments, which most environments are naturally, um, and hence um, camouflaging itself. And, and Taya really is this super fascinating figure. Uh, also as a painter, I think, whose art um, after a while really dissolves this notion of body and landscape, even through individual breast, um, brush strokes that kind of transgress um, these kind of closed boundaries. Um, but to return to the project itself, um, it actually co-enacts, reenacts, co-enacts through digital fabrication, uh, this law of counter shading. Um, and for this, I use a process which I call unrendering. Um, and I'm going to talk you briefly through this process um, first. So first I make plaster copies of an object and I coat these in a thin film of uh, black ink. Um, I also make a digital copy of the object, for which I use photogrammetry. Then this digital copy of the object um, is rendered within a virtual environment. Uh, in this case, again, a toplit environment. Um, and then the digital rendering is then physically re-engraved back onto the object. So you can see that happening here um, with um, uh, using a laser cutter. So you could say it's this digital form of um, this Renaissance ceramic and facade technique called scrapito, um, which essentially inverts an image. Um, so in, in my case, um, this um, unrendering reveals the white plaster under the black coat of ink, wherever the virtual rendering was dark, so hence unrendering. So in a way, it's a kind of a digitally accelerated version of um, Octavia's law. Now to do this, I use um, and develop uh, this kind of bespoke instrumentation, um, which actually allows me to um, access the object from um, all directions for laser cutting, um, and also allows me to calibrate um, laser focal heights. Um, now, I have to say that at the start, my interest was mainly in, in, in making these objects that are counter shaded, but after a while, I, they beca became more kind of conversation pieces that uh, were kind of questioned in themselves. Um, and I started kind of calling my approach um, trans optic parallax. So my interest was actually in shifting my perspective to see through other eyes. So seeing through the eyes, in this case, of a technological other. And the project really tries to understand better through fabrication some of the logics of three-dimensional mapping and projection that operate within virtual or machining processes. So here, for example, in the, in the use of UV mapping in digital rendering, um, so those of you who've used um, um, digital rendering engines will, will know this uh, UV mapping. Uh, and in the case of this um, aspect of the project, I then re-engrave the so-called UV islands of the topological mapping back onto the physical object. For this, I need to develop my own hybrid multifocal mappings. Um, and this image shows actually the kind of three-dimensional version of uh, the way I entered this project. So these 20 eyes looking inwards. Um, and this, this thing I do of addressing you as um, you know, this uh, technological other um, is actually part of the format of the book um, that documents the project. Um, because um, here in, the, in this book, I actually use a technique which I call parallactic writing, which actually means that I'm constantly shifting perspective between the three main um, narrative threads of the project and, and the protagonists and voices. So, Thayer on the left, Gongxi on the right, so these colored rocks, and my own object in the middle. And, and in the middle, I then place the reader or force this reader into the perspective of a technological mode of vision or mapping, um, just like the objects themselves also attempt, attempt to do. And that really leads to the second aspect of parallax that I want to briefly expand uh, on, which is parallax as difference. Um, by this, I mean more of a kind of ethical, philosophical imperative um, to see things through different perspectives, through the eyes of others. And perhaps a good way um, to do this is through looking, uh, examining the sequence of images by um, Jakob von Uxkel, 
from his book called A Stroll Through the Worlds of Animals and Men, um, on which obviously my, my, uh, the name of my project is also obviously based. Um, now, what Von Utzke is trying to do in, this, in, in these images is to find out how a village scene uh, would look like mm, through the eyes of various animals. Mm. So according to Von Utzke, mm, we can only attempt to understand animals if we position ourselves within their own, uh, their very own environment, so what he calls the Umwelt. So his move is to extend Kant's parallactic imperative, so to see through the eyes of fellow humans to the world of the non-human. So this is how he does it. He starts off with this photograph of the village scene, which you can see here, and then he holds this lattice, kind of a perforated screen in front of it. Um, and he wrote, re-photographs this photograph through the screen. Mm, rasterizing the image. And then he takes this photograph, um, so this re photograph photograph, and again re photographs it through the lattice again. And now he says we get a pretty good impression um, of how the village would look like through the eyes of a fly. To then find out how a mollusk, um, so a snail, for example, would see this um, village street, he repeats the process. And until the point where actually there's very much, very little left of the original image, it, apart from these amorphous blobs. Um, and you'll see that in the meantime, he's also built an additional step. Uh, so he's actually um, reproduced the pixelated image as uh, a watercolor painting. So um, the title of this image, so the village street through a mollusk eye, is actually deceptively simple because we're not just looking through the eye of an animal. What we see is a complex layering of different animal, human, and technological visualities, interpretations, and techniques of reproduction. So again, to borrow a term from Donna Haraway, what we're looking through are compound eyes. So in this case, a combination of the painting technique, the camera um, reproduction, um, Etc. The, the, the physical instrumentation. So we could say that Haraway is further extending this um, parallactic imperative um, of Kant and then of Uxko beyond the human others and even beyond the animal others, and he's urging us to include the umwelt of technological others. In another way, we can also say that. Haraway is urging us to see simultaneously through different non-belonging animal, human, and technological eyes. So eyes that are not just different in position, but different in nature. So what happens when we look not just, not just from two eyes of the same kind, so two observatories, two, more, uh, two cameras, um, two or more characters, but when we look simultaneously through the eyes of different others, um, and this is what I call heterogeneous power. And the heterogeneous parallax can become a generative tool, uh, as I've already shown in the speculative crossing of these different practices and perspectives in, in other players' rock garden. Now, this notion of parallax as a generative tool, so as a method of reinvention and co-invention rather than just reconstruction, um, it becomes most explicit in a third project um, I want to show today. Um, Parallax 3, 1929, Jakob Kahn, on the indeterminate training technologies of a reconstructed Bauhaus choreographer. So Jakob Kahn, the new man, um, was actually a collaborative uh, research and performance project, um, which reconstructed the work of a fictional uh, Bauhaus choreographer called Jakob Klinke. Um, and by being collaborative, it introduces um, a sense of otherness that until now I haven't quite discussed yet. And that's the otherness of collaborators in the literal sense, so um, human collaborators. And because these collaborators weren't just architectural researchers, but also a collective of performance makers and researchers, it actually introduced the otherness of the dancing body in the research. Mm. Now, at the basis of this project lie um, two parallactic shifts again. The first one involves, again, a 
historical artistic practice, inspiring project. But the second shift actually involves its removal. So the project's most important historical interlocutor um, or conversation partner um, was the practice of Oskar Schlemmer. Um, so Schlemmer, as many of you will know, was originally a painter who turned um, into a sculptor, then turned uh, choreographer. And his practice eventually also turned towards the technological other. Mm. So in his, in his performance at the, uh, or many performances at Bauhaus, he developed these, these costumes and his props and movement sequences that constrained the dancers uh, to execute these mechanical geometric motions with a clockwork precision. What he wanted was for the dancers to submit to this other logic in order, in order to generate previously inconceivable choreographies. And this is what I'd say a parallactic imperative again, which hoped that by engaging with the machinic other could lead to a sense of de-individuation. So challenging notions of self and subjectivity. So for Schlemmer, really the technological other that manifested itself at the time, so in the 20s, 30s, by these emerging new technologies was to him really not a threat, but a quote, enrichment of modes of expression, end quote. Now, if you're familiar with the work of Schlemmer, chances are real that you'll know it through um, this filmic reconstruction of the tragic uh, ballet, which is actually from 1922, but the reconstruction is from 1970. And it's this bold and colorful film uh, set to catchy music, uh, has fast cuts and montage and zooms, etc. Um, super entertaining, you should watch it. But it's also, in a way, quite harmless because, as Thorsten Blume, uh, the dance historian, has argued, this reconstruction tells us less about Schlemmer's ambition of machinic empathy and transcendence through dance than it actually tells us about the naive progress optimism and pop art of the 1960s and 70s. And I think this is important to point out to point out because it highlights a couple of things. So first of all, it shows the agency of the technologies of reconstruction. So in this case, the rules of filmic framing and editing, um, but also materials such as um, PVC, which is incredibly popular, started being incredibly popular in the 60s. Um, and so it also shows this historical situatedness um, of the reconstructor. And if we now look at that through a Baradian um, lens, um, which I introduced before, it shows that Schlemmer's performance doesn't really have a quote original, and that the past event that is somehow like the past itself, um, that is that is that that it's not just simply there. So it's not just the past that can be represented or reenacted. Much more, it's a performance that is co-enacted and co-authored by the present day performing bodies and technologies. So perhaps rather than dismissing this 1970 reconstruction, because it leaves all its fingerprints all over the original quote um, performance, what we should challenge is perhaps the viewer's assumption that there is such a thing as touching something without leaving fingerprints. So the idea that one is looking at a transparent representation rather than a situated enactment. And, and this observation leads to a second parallactic shift at the basis of this project, um, which is actually the removal of the very notion of an original. So rather than reconstructing the work of a historical, choreographer, a choreographer is invented. Um, so Jakob Klenke, this invention is actually reconstruction without an original. So what we're doing is kind of speculatively modifying and massaging this diagram of parallax. And what is left is the generative capacity of the reconstruction itself. So meaning that we can now fully embrace this creative opportunities that of the technologies of the of reconstruction you know, and our own situatedness as reconstructors. So we can ask, for example, what would a Bauhaus choreographer have done if he or she had a LiDAR scanner? And we can bring in contemporary questions 
um, like the 21st century idea of quantified self and makeable body and look at that through a historical um, um, narrative or comment that through this narrative. Um, and um, I'm kind of nearly, nearly done uh, with the talk, so don't um, worry about time. I'm just going to talk through two or three aspects of, of, the, of the performance, not the entire performance, but just a couple of elements perhaps that the performance and the research project that can give us an impression um, of the methodology of collective co-enactment of bodies and technologies. So we traveled to Dessau and slept in, in Klenke's bed in a studio in the Bauhaus of Dessau. We digitally captured the studio, um, first digitally, then physically, we reconstructed these choreographic sequences. Um, these sequences are then captured and digitized and transported to the set of our re-performance in Hamburg, which is co-inhabited by the audience, the performance, and these ghosts of the digital, physical, um, hybrid reenactment. And then these recorded movements are regarded as these reconfigurable pieces of evidence. So they can be algorithmically interpolated and used as inputs for improvisation. The stage itself is then understood as something between exhibition stage sets and gymnastic studio. And mm, the defining element of, the, of this um, stage design um, are these um, bent steel tube uh, instruments. And these again can, like in the last project, be described as a crossing with various heterogeneous inputs. So first of all, they're reconstructions, or rather, reinventions of Jakob Klenke's studio and the Bauhaus of Dessau. Secondly, there are also quotes of um, the famous steel uh, tube furniture, Bauhaus designer Marcel, Marcel Breuer. And thirdly, thirdly, they actually pick up elements of contemporary fitness apparatus. Now, the thing is that it's never quite clear what the performers are meant to train with these instruments. So we started calling them open-ended or indeterminate reconstruction instruments. And they're designed incrementally as they're constantly being confronted and formed uh, by a much less predictable um, input value, which is the performing body itself. And what is clear is that these instruments kind of oscillate between prescription and invention. So very much in the spirit of Schlemmer between constraint and affordance, between training and untraining. Now, if we zoom back out to the scale of the overall stage, um, what you can see here is that these reconstructions and reconstruction instruments are actually arranged within multiple versions of Klenke's room, which intersect and overlap. So, hope you can, oh, sorry. I hope you can see my mouse. You can see um, one version of the bed here and the door next to it there, another version of the bed here and the door next to it there, and then the kind of the balcony and the door to the balcony um, over here, one version of that, another version of that, et cetera. And they kind of, they overlap and, and intersect. Um, now this overlapping arrangement was actually quite directly inspired by the LiDAR scans that we made of the studio and, and the bar house in Dessau. Um, obviously it was a fictional choreographer, so it didn't actually, did, but that's not really the point. Um, now, before the scans are aligned in the processing software, as those of you who used LiDAR scanners um, will know, the interesting thing is that each scan knows exactly where other things or other points are in relationship to its own vantage point, but it has no idea where other scans are in relationship to itself. So there's this series of point clouds of this fragmented bar house that are competing somehow for veracity. And it's super tempting to kind of indulge in this resonance that this um, image has with the famous passage by Siegfried Gideon, uh, the famous modernist architectural historian, in which he describes the Bauhaus building, so the same building, um, as follows, quote, there is the hovering vertical grouping of planes which satisfies our feeling of a relational space, and there is the extensive transparency that permits interior and exterior to be seen simultaneously en face and en profil. Like Picasso's La Lisienne of 1911-1912, a variety of levels of 
reference or of points of reference and simultaneity, end of quote. But what Gideon is referring to here, these various points of reference are all visual ones. So in other words, the parallax he's describing is still homogeneous. Just like actually the parallax between our two scans, which in this image now are registered. But I think actually that there's a, a richer kind of sense of simultaneity and parallax at play um, here, which is a heterogeneous one. What I mean by this is that the, the accumulating layers of a working process, virtual and actual layers of a saturated space, uh, but also the embodied and layered memories of our visits and reenactments. So all of these layers co-inhabit the synchronous, heterogeneous assemblage that is the project. Now, various elements like uh, on-stage projections try to break this notion of a single homogeneous space of uh, performance. This device, for example, which you can see on the right here, and which hinges around this uh, upright part of one of the reconstruction instruments, actually allows the viewer to see with one eye only tiny islands of vision. So very similar to the collimated individual laser rays of the LiDAR scanner. Now, the, for the viewer, the set then dissolves into a series of radial points, so a horizontal slice of the scanner's visual otherness. Again, it's a transoptic instrument that invites us to enter into a sympathy with the optical, spatial, and performative assemblage um, of heterogeneous components that make up the project. I'm going to be relatively brief about, um, and, and then I'll um, come to the conclusion um, about the reconstruction of Jakob Penke himself, um, another part of the research, um, which again was a crossing um, uh, in, in this case of, of the performance, it's, uh, performers sorry, um, themselves. And be, we thought that because of the accumulative kind of collective process that is Jakob uh, um, we imagine this in, as this crossing between different uh, performers. So we photogrammetrically again scan these performers uh, and then created these composite masks that were attached to the reconstruction instruments, um, but also animated these interpolations that slowly shifted between these input identities. Now, as a conclusion, I want to return to this notion of parallax and what's become of it. Um, so perhaps, in the, in, and I'm hoping to discuss this further with you um, after the talk. Um, so in this first project about laws, the way I was using parallax was very much as a method, first and foremost, of, um, as a method of reconstruction. Now, in a later project, especially this one, parallax becomes a generative tool. So there's this shift in authorship away from the historical artifact, artifact from the original, or so-called original, towards perhaps the agency of the instrumentation, of the technology, its rules, its textures, and aesthetics. Um, and the tools of reproduction become the tools of production. The logic of reconstruction constructs the piece itself. So parallax in this project becomes a mode of invention. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you all for um, joining. Um, this is, uh, if you want to take a further look um, at some of the other work, that's my website and my Instagram. Um, so it's a, just a part of the work I, I, I showed you today, which is my PhD. But there's a lot, lot more out there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, thank you for doing this. This was uh, really comprehensive. <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of, I do have a lot of questions, uh, but I don't think we have that much time. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, 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 no. It's not you. It's just, uh, there's so many uh, interesting projects that you are involved, we were involved that the questions we, you know, we need a couple of days to go through everything. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, I do want to uh, encourage you, uh, everyone to, you know, uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions. Now is the time. Um, I will break the ice. I do have mm -hmm. um, 
a question that you might be able to answer. Um, and I actually want to, you know, go down, uh, go back to the beginning, sort of. So how I, you mentioned it at the very beginning is, you know, I, while I was writing this paper and doing a review on, on the art uh, of LIDAR and point clouds, uh, that's how I found your work on laser scanners uh, from 2015. And, um, and while I'm personally, uh, you know, still trying to wrap my head around uh, Barad's work, and a, ge a gentle realism and everything. I can see how in the meantime, you really dwelled into it really deeply, but I wanted to, uh, to go back to those works in uh, about point clouds, with point clouds. Um, there was this work, The Masks of Fleet Street, um, mm -hmm. where that you presented as a point cloud performances. And um, I, I'm sort of interested, first of all, how did you end up, what led you to actually start working with laser scanners? Because it's not an intuitively architectural technology. It is used for uh, reconstructions. Uh, but um, from my perspective as a geomatic engineer, it's more of to land surveyors to use that. And the other thing is also to, to draw a line uh, with Barad's work uh, the the fact that uh, laser scanner LIDAR is actually a really good example of a technology that is used for representation and, and it's so conventionally, you know, uh, just seen as a, you know, something that's going to just copy the reality. Uh, was mm -hmm. that also, yeah, how did you end up doing this? And, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, great, great, um, great questions. Um, I mean, to answer the question how I got into it, that was, that's, um, so at the Bartlett School of Architecture, there's actually two, um, two graduates um, who graduated, I think maybe four or five years before me, who actually set up a practice um, um, called ScanLab Projects, um, which um, works a lot with artists and does their own artistic work uh, using, using uh, at the start, mainly LiDAR scanning. Um, and um, actually, there's another ex-colleague of mine who also worked there, um, Tom. Um, and um, so that's kind of how I got into it um, after school. And I think, um, in a way, perhaps this 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 um, understanding that it is, I think it is perhaps quite a natural thing for architects nowadays to move into. Um, because uh, I don't know if you've seen online this um, project by Foster and Partners um, recently, a big, big architecture firm in, in, in London, um, who actually were working uh, with Boston Dynamics um, um, on actually having uh, this robotic dog with a LiDAR scanner uh, scan a uh, construction site as it's being built. Um, and so the, the, the kind of the dog, spot the dog is called, uh, constantly walks through the construction site, meaning that they kind of get a perfect mirror image of the construction site as it's going on. So it's not just used in um, in in kind of heritage uh, management, etc., but also now in the sense that um, you know we get uh, we have a kind of a constant feedback between these kind of virtual and um, actual. Um, instances of, of, of buildings. And I think that's actually really fascinating because that leads on to your next question, which um, I think is exactly this question of veracity. Um, um, and, and, and so this notion that these kind of um, technologies of vision and softwares that we use are there to provide copies um, or duplicates or mirror images um, of something that we want to build or something that we have built, um, I think is um, useful, but also a, a narrow kind of understanding. And it, I think that's really similar to, you know, emerging photography in the start of the 20th century or end of the 19th century, where it was seen as a, not just um, something that depicts reality, but also something that has a kind of perhaps phantasmagoric even, you know, potential, uh, but also something that, um, 
in a way extends their own visual literacy. I think that's quite important. That, and that, that's why I kind of tried to bring across in the book is that it's not just an instrument that we stand above and that we use uh, to make things more efficient, but it's also something that kind of somehow can kind of uh, blow our mind and make us think of things differently. <laughs> Um, and that has an incredible kind of creative uh, potential, um, not just as a copying machine, but as a kind of a creator of new and weird and wonderful worlds. Um, and yeah, that, I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like, I like through the through some of the projects that I. Um, uh, explored your projects and some of the papers that I've read. I like when you use the term of a machine eye, uh, which is exactly mm -hmm. uh, what it is. And it's really interesting to see, to just look at the LIDAR from that point of view. Uh, and mm. yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. Which is, a, which is, of course, a projection, right? If we call it an eye, it's a very kind of anthropomorphic projection, which is in itself kind of problematic but actually interesting because we can start seeing our own eyes in different ways as well if we kind of allow us to make this kind of um you know if we allow us to uh to to cross these kind of different interpretations and and we we allow ourselves to be on the same level then we can also we need to also make the reverse kind of um conclusion and see our own eyes as, as different than just this um perspectival single human eye etc yeah exactly yeah uh, okay, thank you. Um, so anyone else here wants to have some questions to ask? Feel free to unmute yourself or maybe. Okay, so Nina. Okay, I don't know, Thomas. I can read the question out loud. So mm -hmm. Nina, Nina just asked a question in the chat. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Great talk. Just wondering if you have any thoughts on AI uh, slash intelligence systems and how these non-human perspectives agencies can be understood through Barad's ontoepistemological framework. I mean, I have to say I'm really not an expert in AI uh, at all. <laughs> no, I don't even know that much about it. Um, but I think in, in a way this um, perhaps what I propose as this kind of parallactic approach uh, is something that can be applied to, um, I think, many emerging kind of technologies. So this extension of our own kind of um, mode of thinking on a kind of a, a, a basis of equality, if that makes sense, not on a basis of kind of um, notions of hierarchy and domination. Um, I think that that kind of applies both to kind of technological realms, but also wider kind of societal realms. Uh, Really, I mean, this, this term can be um, extended uh, far beyond that. Um, and I think really what I find really interesting about Barad's work is that, you know, it, 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 it seems, and I think also the way I, I explained some of it, I mean, she's got so much fantastic writing and also writing that I think is really interesting because it's not just scientific, but also very poetic um, at times. Um, so she's kind of herself mixing kind of modes of inquiry. Um, but the, the real power of her work for me is that it goes beyond this pure understanding of physics. So she does describe these experiments in quantum physics, but what she said is that the consequences of this kind of um, very zoomed in kind of a particle level inquiry are completely scalable and they apply to um, you know they apply to loads of kind of different realms um, and 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 so I think that's perhaps why why she um, she's a very kind of um, interesting thinker for, for for our times really um, and 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 I think also why I think a lot of people in design research um, and artistic research are looking looking at their work. Um, I think kind of almost being naturally attracted to people who work in sciences, but also um, include notions of indeterminacy, where things are not as clear cut as uh, you might expect them to be from, you know, uh, physics. Um, 
I mean, if we return to Siegfried Gideon, for example, I mean, he used, he actually used and misused, um, he was the, he was the um, architectural historian I quoted on the Bauhaus building, he talks about um, um, Copius and, and Picasso, he actually used and misused um, Einstein's theories on, on relativity. Einstein really hated it. But I think um, the reason for that is that he also saw this kind of, you know, um, technological discourse taking over an artistic discourse. But then if within the technological or scientific discourse, um, you, can, you can find an essence or a kernel of um, ambivalence, that becomes really powerful. Um, and I think that's, that's a, an analogy perhaps between uh, Gideon's work and, and, and Barat's work and why I'm perhaps also interested in, in, in those two. So sorry, that was, a, that was a long answer. It really doesn't answer your question of AI, but I think in a way I would say that that's, um, that, that, yeah, you can use it as a kind of, I think a mindset and a sense of um, otherness um, and an awareness for the material instrumentation that we are using. I think that's very important. I mean, you see at the start, you said, you know, it's important to be here to make things. And that's, I think, exactly the point that um, Barat makes because she draws her attention to the physicality of these, of these tests, which automatically make it impossible for us to stand outside. So like I, like I said about Haraway at the start, you know, we can no longer take in the God perspective, the view from outside. As soon as we try to do that, we find ourselves again entangled in, in another sense of, um, of, of, of polyperspectivalism. And I wonder, could you apply that to, you know, could you apply that to AI perhaps as well? Is it, is it something, is it, uh, does it create its own kind of shadows and unknowns? Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I'm also not a very good expert in AI. So <laughs> I'll just, um, I'm just soaking everything um i don't know if uh, anyone else has a question but really feel free to use the chat or just ask i think them. also questions because we don't I, I think it's important to say that we don't just need to have a higher level inquiry like i did i did a, uh, a kind of a test presentation yesterday with friends and, and they were also just asking um very um banal questions like why did you do this and i don't understand the connection between this and this um yeah, which, actually, which is also fine because I think there's a lot of, you know, there's there is a tendency, I think, you know, that, well, I, I, in a way, you know, there's in, in the work, there's a the mixture between, I think, this precision and error always. And, and then the way you present, the way I present it perhaps goes towards the error side of things. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at, at its essence, is always kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, at least a, an attempt to um, find out. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you um, uh, a question re in regards to your PhD. Um, mm -hmm. So here at Satsi Lab, we're also ha uh, doing, me personally and a couple of other people on the call, and we're doing a practice-based PhD. And it's still, even though it's not that novel, uh, it is still a novelty to many people when, you know, uh, because it's not a regular PhD, I guess um mm. in their eyes at least <laughs> and um i just uh, i'm i'm really i'm just i'm not even yeah six months in and I'm, i wanted to when when we had our first conversation you were you just submitted your thesis uh, your mm. work and i wanted to hear out your experiences and how was the practice based phd for you and um and yeah also another question on top of that and then mm -hmm. I'm, I'm out of questions for now. Um, I'm, uh, now that I'm looking through your work and you, as I said earlier, you really dive deep into uh, Barad's work. I'm just uh, uh, interested in, were, were you led eventually by practice? Because there's, you know, I can see performances, I can see design, I can see uh, scans and there are really a lot of areas that you're covering with your projects and I'm just, curious 
what uh, what led you was that the theory or this is just really your genuine interest in each of those projects because i can see laser scanning also uh, you know lidar appearing in almost every sweet sequence or photogrammetry yeah 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 completely yeah um so perhaps to start with the question about the phd by design um i mean the, the bartlett really has a really fantastic phd by architectural design program um which in a way, I think, uh, well, they also have a, have a history and theory um, uh, PhD program, but I think what's really valuable about the, about the design program is that um, it's really allowing you to kind of find out uh, through, through the work. Uh, so it is kind of encouraged to kind of have an, at the start at least, not really knowing what you're doing, which is always really difficult for any, any student, even a PhD student. Uh, as as you might well know this year, uh, and and in a way things start crystallizing over time, mm. and it's really difficult to say if that is through the practice work or through the theoretical work, and and perhaps also um, it's important to say that my two um, supervisors, so Professor Peg Ross, um, is actually a philosopher, so she introduced me to a lot of um, post-humanist. Uh, feminist thinkers uh, kind of also with the, you know, and, and kind of um, not just technology critique, but uh, well, like a kind of, well, a, a wider philosophical thinking about the implications of novel technologies. And now Professor Ned Chart is actually a professor for experimental design. And I think is a lot more design led. So it was also, you know, this kind of perhaps schizophrenic nature of the work which you also could see um, in the presentation um, was also reflected in my supervisors, but I think was really kind of productive because it's constantly forcing you to see through, see through this philosophical lens, see through this theoretical lens at the same time as doing these kind of um, more open-ended experiments. And I, and I have to say one, one thing that I did um, learn throughout the process is that you know in the last project I did show, um, I did kind of point out the fact that you know it, the the other that was introduced there was the kind of human collaborator other, and that I think for me in the process of doing a PhD was really important because after doing you know two years of more introspective, well not introspective but like you know um, closed off kind of projects, which I did kind of by myself. Um, I really wanted uh, to work with others. Uh, and I think, you know, as an architect, you normally, or as a designer, you work, you work with others, you work in groups um, and it's a collective process. And that really, really made the, um, the process, I think a lot more enjoyable, but then again, I think those first two years of being quite introspective were super important to define my approach to these projects afterwards. Um, of which not I, like that, the, the third project I showed is not the last one in my PhD, but, um, so yeah, I, and and yeah, it, I think it is very much um, what what you make um, what you make of it of the program. But I think in a way, accepting the fact that design is um, or artistic research is a form of knowledge production in itself, which is which is valuable. I think is really important about these kind of the, the um, PhD by practice um, programs that we're kind of accepting them as, you know, we're not trying to. We're not trying to judge them with the uh, with the parameters that we use to judge a traditional PhD in its form of what knowledge does it create, because that's the definition of research. But we're saying, okay, there's other types of knowledge um, that actually might be interesting to develop ways of writing and talking about. Um, and that, for me, is, I think, the real value of, of, of these programs. Okay, thank you. It's actually uh, really soothing to hear that uh, you, 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 you didn't know much when you started. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is very overwhelming uh, for me personally. And um, yeah, it's just, it, it's a lot of things to cover and to learn about. And uh, um, yeah, thank you for this. Yes, I, I think there might be a question from Annie. Um, yeah, hello, hello, Thomas. Hi. Uh, thank you <laughs> for the insights. 
Uh, I have a question about the last project about the performance. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was just wondering about the audience of this project. So obviously, let's say you've made a recording of the performance in various ways, both digitally and through film. So there is the audience in front of the screen, but what, a, and um, obviously there is a very well choreograph, choreographed uh, presentation for them. But what about the um, audience, which is in the hall? Like were, yeah. was the audience in the hall choreographed also in a very specific way or yeah, how was the relationship between yeah. these two audiences? Yeah. I mean, that's a really, I think that's a really good question. And the question that we thought about um, as well, obviously, you know, I have to say this is a project I did. We were a collective of five people. So um, uh, like also all credits are on my website, just to, you know, um, I, I was one of two of the set designers um, and, and artistic collaborators. But as you can, I, I just switched to this image because it's a, it's a plan of the, um, of the, uh, of the performance uh, space, quite a big space. But you can see kind of if you can see my mouse is that we actually kind of um, we complete we we um, excluded the normal um, audience seating area from the performance, so we actually only used the the stage itself, and and we kind of choreographed the um, audience through the actual actual stage and also allowed for moments, for example, when they came in, uh, not a lot happened. There were a couple of projections. That they were allowed for about ten minutes to just explore the stage as a kind of as a, um, almost as an exhibition to kind of allow for the sense of perhaps wonder and openness that these kind of um, for example the reconstruction instruments the steel tube instruments allow you know this kind of what are they what on what on earth are they you know and then during the performance they were kind of activated by some of the performers but after that um, there is a moment where you know. Performance ends, and you know, you know the, the the audience is also on on the stage, and it could be awkward, but it was kind of it was really nice because it opened in quite an, an it, sorry it ended in quite an open way, in which then the audience was allowed to um, use the instruments themselves, uh, aided by the performers. So they did all kinds of really weird things on these on these instruments, which is super lovely, and kind of um, allowed for this process of invention, which I think started. You know, in our heads with this kind of crossing of these input elements um, to to be an ongoing process, really, and and I think that's yeah, that that really was super important to us. Not to be, I think, perhaps not to be, you know, um, post dramatic. It's often called, you know, when you when you're not allowing for the frontal relationship between uh, performers and and, and and audience. And, and you're involving them, et cetera, but we really wanted them to become an active part of the invention itself and of the reconstruction itself. And often they would come with their own stories about, you know, this fictional choreographer and make up things, you know. It was really fantastic. Like they would say like, oh, I think he was also this uh, person, you know, was also really interested in this. And, and that was just really kind of lovely to see that both on a physical and on an intellectual level that kind of entangled mm, the, the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. There's. Oh. Um, Everybody just saying thank you. Yeah. People need. I think people need to go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting for us from uh, in Australia where we can only go and have a glass of wine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Only if, yeah, yeah, I don't know, maybe someone has a deadline, but yeah, you can still have a glass of wine. Um, I think we're perfectly on time. Uh, so if there's no further questions, I would love to close this uh, forum for today. Uh, once again, mm -hmm. thank you, Thomas, for your time. This, this is really valuable. And as I said, the, the session was recorded and um, everyone who joined the panel will get a uh, whole of the copy. And um, yeah, I'll just, if, in case people are interested in, uh, in um, Sensilab, here's the website. You can also opt into our newsletter and learn more about our projects. Um, and that being said, um, yeah, thanks everyone who joined. Um, really, it was lovely to spend an afternoon with all of you and learn about this really awesome research. Eh? <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks everyone. And, Thank you very uh, much.
See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.